Okay. Yeah. Welcome everybody. I uh, really appreciate y'all being here. You, you, you timely folks who have arrived uh, right at the beginning of this event. Um, my name's Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're excited to host this presentation on anti-fascism and disability by Moss Williams, which is a follow-up uh, to a presentation that Moss gave last September. If you missed it, it's still up on YouTube and it was great. Um, okay, so Firestorm is an almost 16 year old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to book um, some events virtually because we love reaching people at a distance. And we know that virtual events expand the accessibility of the content that we produce. This week, we're actually doing two more virtual events, which is cool because we took a little break. I, we've been very focused on in-person content since Mm, the beginning of winter. And so this is a little bit of a return, uh, but this week, uh, in addition to tonight, we've got um, tomorrow and we'll be hearing from Andrew Lee, the author of Defying Displacement, Urban Recomposition and Social War. That's a conversation with Vicki Osterweil on uh, gentrification. Um, and then on, on Tuesday, we'll be joined by Angela Hume, uh, the author of Deep Care, to discuss the history of underground abortion services in the US. So if you're interested in those topics, which you definitely are because you're here tonight, uh, then you should follow us on social media um, and uh, I'll drop a link to our newsletter and calendar and stuff in the chat. And those events uh, tomorrow and the next night are similar to this ones that you should register for um, so that you can get the link and or the recording. Okay. So uh, similar to past events, we are using Zoom webinar, which has a Q&A tool. If you've got any questions at any point, um, just go ahead and type them into the Q&A. You can put reflections there too. Um, but uh, I will note that it's a little difficult for Moss to see your reflections and questions directly while also doing a screen share. So I'm gonna do my best to share things as they come in or as we can get to them. Um, and I apologize if you put something there and it doesn't make it to Moss. Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, today's event is a fundraiser for the Pandemic Solidarity for the Long Haul, a Black-led multiracial group focused on developing a blueprint for true pandemic solidarity. With your help, I think we've raised about $180, um, but we'd love to send more money their way. So if you're able to chip in now, and maybe you weren't able to during registration or you missed it, um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. Lots of links I'm promising you. I, I'm definitely gonna get them there this time. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the final thing I wanna acknowledge, which is um, a bit more serious. I mean, all of this is serious, but I just wanna acknowledge the context of um, the murder of Nex Benedict, uh, a Choctaw teen in so-called Oklahoma. And this is, something that I think a lot of us have been feeling pretty heavy about over the last few days. Um, and I think as we get into the topic tonight and explore issues of gendered violence, I want us to keep Nex in mind um, and all of the, the young adults uh, who and kids who are dealing with this horrible transphobic world right now. Moss is a disabled, non-binary, anti-fascist, and abolitionist organizer, writer, and artist. They've traveled all over the U.S. and Canada doing workshops on disability, anti-fascism, philosophy, and self-defense. They've also written uh, a soon-to-be-published essay for the Anarchism and Punk Book Project, which has several volumes. Moss, maybe you can clarify which volume your essay will be in, because I was curious. It'll be But that's not the topic tonight, <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> do it at your leisure. <laughs> Take it away, Moss. Really appreciate you coming back for a second conversation. Yeah, very glad to be here. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, uh, let's get started. So this is the part where it makes, after I start sharing my screen, it makes it really hard for me to see what's going on with anybody else. So I apologize if I miss anything. Uh, thank you, Liberty, for helping me out that. All right, so uh, can we see that okay? 
Yep, that looks great. Okay, perfect. So I got a whole new list of books for you today. You can see my little stack over here. And I didn't actually end up getting all of these into the talk today, um, but I did do, I did read all these sort of as background. Um, I will also be sending out this list to Liberty to send out afterwards. I heard that everyone got really excited about the book list last time. And it's one of the reasons I like working with bookstores because I love books and books are really important to fighting fascism and to learning about our world. So yay, books, up the books. And um, here's what we're going to kind of be referencing today. I want to acknowledge that Lendy Bancroft, the author of Why Does He Do That, um, has abuse allegations also uh because he that's a book about abuse and um i'm aware of that i also think it's actually it's still a pretty it's still a good book for since he's an abuser talking about how abusers function it kind of still works and i but if that makes people uncomfortable i just wanted to acknowledge that i'm aware of the i'm aware of that and you can avoid that book um if you if you want to um so before we start i just want to really quickly talk about dialectical analysis um, and how I'm talking about these issues because there's like heavy issues and they're very emotionally fraught issues and they're very specific issues and I'm sort of going to be talking in like broad strokes and comparing possibly very different kinds of issues and I just wanted to acknowledge that what I'm doing by comparing these things is not saying that they are the same thing or like that they are um, so for instance a versus b not a equals b that these things are the same but that we're going to look at them both at the same time to kind of learn new things about them right so if you compare a bird to an airplane you're going to see different concepts like oh you're going to think about flying and wings and air speed and all of those kinds of things then if you compare a bird to an alligator right and like oh wow they have the same ancestral history of dinosaurs blah, blah blah right so i just wanted to put that out there right now because we are talking about inflammatory subjects and um it, and emotional subjects so just i'm a you know i'm not i'm not conflating any of these things i'm just talking about them at the same time to sort of see connections okay that moving on all the content warnings yeah, all of them basically um so i just want to say that you all are really real for coming to this on a beautiful sunday evening because <laughs> i know that this is not that fun to talk about but, you know, a lot of things are not fun, and um, I really hope this is helpful. For me, it's actually, uh, it's liberating to kind of understand our world better. So by, my hope here is that it's not uh, just a horrible time where we're re revamping all the, the trauma and terror that we're all, that we're going through and that um, people in our community are going through, but that we're sort of helping understand the context of what's happening, which helps us move forward and helps us in our work, to, uh, make our work more sort of effective and uh, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping it's not gonna be horrible. My toxic trait is I tend to make a joke out of things that are really not funny. Um, so if I do that, I apologize. It's because these things are close to my heart too, and it is hard. So I suggest you go and get some water. Got water in a jar here, it's not showing. Okay, uh, maybe a fidget, something to hug. Can I have a little huggy? Oh yeah, I got a teddy bear here. Um, and I'm I'm gonna try to not keep it horrible. All right, and but you know, take breaks. Um, it is gonna be recorded. If you feel like stepping away at any time, I'm not gonna be offended. You can leave. That's fine. I totally understand. Um, but I am gonna. It hopefully it's just more informative than just like re-traumatizing. Yeah. And like I said, um, I'm not going to be able to content warning every time I'm going to talk about something horrible because it's all pretty horrible. And uh, my brain is looks like a toy bin in someone's attic. So, all right, moving on. Reminder of where we left off at the last one. We had talked about different uh, definitions of fascism. And I had sort of settled on, we're not talking about fascism as capitalism in crisis because capitalism has uh, learned very well how to uh, recapitulate and wow, I wrote this word down because it's like I remembered this word and then I forgot it again. <sighs> um, capitalism is 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 reforming all the time in the ways that it needs to. So we're talking about fascism instead as a colonialism come home to roost as a, as a crisis of white settlerism. Um, that's so. If you want to hear more about that particular thing, you can go back and watch the first session. 
All right, so that's the grounding of like where we're starting with what fascism is. All right, now on to the good stuff. How does a state define its power? So uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, the state is a form of human association distinguished from other social groups by its purpose, the establishment of order and security, its methods, the law and their enforcement, its territory, the area of jurisdiction or geographic boundaries, and finally by its sovereignty. So you can see I put there, what is the purpose of the state? How does it establish order and security? How does it define order and security? Um, and how does it enforce those laws? Right. I'm going to read this book, some of this book here. This book is uh, The Right to Maim. Man, that's annoying. Uh, 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 there it is. By Jasper K. Puar. This book is very dense, but I recommend it highly. Um, it kind of blew my mind. And uh, it's also got really beautiful cover art. I love books. Okay. So uh, to sort of make it simpler, we can define this. A state defines its power and shows its power by its right to kill and its right to maim. Okay. So just, just going right in, we're going to talk about um, what that means. So the the right to kill the right to maim are key elements in the racializing biopolitical logic of security both are mobilized to make power visible on the body slated for death or slated for debilitation both are forms of the racialization of individuals and populations that liberal disability rights frameworks advocating for social accommodation access acceptance pride and empowerment are unable to account for so um they talk about the parallels between Ferguson and Gaza, where in the United States, the state shows its power with its right to kill, um, how police officers can just sort of kill without any sort of consequences because it's a show of state power. Um, and in Gaza, Israel shows its power through um, its right to maim up until October 6th, uh, obviously there was a lot of killing as well, but um, prior to that, there was, Israel was sort of known for its humanitarian oppression, where it was more likely to maim um, Palestinians than to kill them. Um, so the, U the U.S. security state enacted powerful sovereignty entitlements, even as it simultaneously claimed tremendous vulnerability. The police were merely doing their jobs. This is in Ferguson, a dangerous, life-threatening one. This calculation of risk is the founding rationalization for the imp impunity of the right to kill wielded by U.S. law enforcement. The might of Israel's military, one of the most powerful in the world, is built upon the claim of an unchanging ontological vulnerability and precarity driven by history, geopolitics, and geography. Alongside the right to kill, I noted a complementary logic long present in Israel tactical calculations of settler colonial rule, that of creating injury and maintaining Palestinian pop populations as perpetually debilitated and yet alive in order to control them. So basically the state is uh, about control and it shows that control through killing and maiming whoever it wants to, right? So that's fun. Um, yeah, so there is a long history of solidarity between Black liberation movement, movements in the U.S. and the Palestinian liberation movement because they both resist the state's claimed entitlement to kill and maim. Um, I'm going to read another horrible, we're just, we're just jumping right into it. This is um, from a book called Light in Gaza, which I really highly recommend. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, from 2022, but it's... Um, let's see in the pile there it's writings born of fire it's writings by palestinians and there's there's essays and poetry and it's really a beautiful book um but i just wanted to bring this home maybe in the in the u.s context or people who are in the u.s we've if you if you're not living absolutely under a white supremacist rock then you know about um the police violence in the u.s um but just to kind of show that this is a colonial rule thing. Here's just a short quote from an essay by a Palestinian 
Um, my father was injured in the attack and had to deal with the shrapnel of the bullet that ricocheted and hit his shoulder. For decades, especially in cold weather, he suffered from some sort of phantom pain. The whole family had to live with the trauma that our father and breadwinner was almost killed in an instant, a trauma in whose shadow we still live. So he was just driving from work in Palestine and was randomly shot at by an Israeli officer. Um, and that kind of shows that it's like, then you, with that debilitation, instead of being killed also with that debilitation, that person and everyone around that person has physical, has a very physical experience of state power kind of in their bodies. Um, that pain is just always there as a reminder that um, Israel claims the right to name, right? Um, another example of this is uh, Yitzhak Rabin during the first intifada in the 90s. Um, this is a quote from Al Jazeera. Under Israel's then defense minister, Israel army commanders were instructed to break the bones of Palestinian protesters. Today, this policy has evolved to specifically target the knees and legs of Palestinian youth to disable them. And this is something that's not talked about as much as the murders but it's a really important understanding of the full framework of how a state um, decides that it owns your body and therefore can do whatever it wants to that body, right? So this is all kind of contextual. So we're gonna talk about disabled versus debilitated. Um, do we have any questions or anything so far? Should I stop and take a second? I'm still kind of warming up, but. I think we're good, okay. I think you should keep going and uh, maybe a good reminder to folks that you can go ahead and put questions in the Q&A. We'll definitely get to as many as possible later and maybe we'll scoop some as we go. Okay. So disabled versus debilitated. And this is a theory that I first heard of in this book, the right to name. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we're giving credit where credit is due but it makes perfect sense to me. Um, so I'm just gonna read another quote from them. Disability is not a fixed state or attribute, but exists in relation to assemblages of capacity and debility. So by capacity, uh, the author means, um, as opposed to incapacitated, where you're no longer able to do something, capacitation is um, making it so you're able to do something. Um, the modulated across historical time, geopolitical space, institutional mandates, and discursive regimes. The globalization of disability as an identity through human rights discourses contributes to a standardization of bodily usefulness and uselessness that discounts not only the specificity of location, but also the way bodies exceed or defy identities and subjects. So, um, I contend that the term debilitation is distinct from the term disablement because it foregrounds the slow wearing down of populations instead of the event of becoming disabled. While the latter concept creates and hinges on a narrative of before and after for individuals who will eventually be identified as disabled, the former comprehends those bodies that are sustained in a perpetual state of debilitation precisely through foreclosing the social, cultural, and political translation to disability. So, Basically, um, this author argues that disability is a limited term and is a is a neoliberal identity of somebody who is expected to have longevity and is expected to be able to work and be a productive member of society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then something happens. There's an accident of some kind or something happens to this person and then they have become disabled. Um, or there's like, some, you know, something about them is changed or different as opposed to the debilitation where certain populations are seen as expendable naturally and are just worn down over time by lack of resources, by lack of medical care, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that those folks do not get to be part of the identity of disabled um, because they are expected there was, there's no expectation of their longevity, right? So that is, I think, a really interesting point. Um, 
So this quote here, we will all be disabled one day if we live long enough. The disability to come is already built on an entitled hope and expectation for a certain longevity. Um, disability is posited as the most common identity category because we will all belong to it someday if we live long enough. But um, Bertland formulate, I don't know who that is. It says somewhere up here of slow death implies that we might not only be haunted by disability to come, but also disavowing the debility that is already here. More transiently, some are living the disability that does not get codified or recognized as such, not only as a true side of insufficiency, but as a mark or remainder or reminder of that which is already constituted as insufficient. So for some folks, their body is already constituted as insufficient, right? You don't get to be disabled if you were supposed to be worn down and killed by the state anyway, okay? Well, this is the debilitation for capitalism's sake. Uh, simply put, debility is profitable for capitalism. In, neo in neoliberal biomedical and biotechnological terms, the body is always debilitated in relation to its ever-expanding potentiality. This is precisely what Foucault presciently outlined in his 1978 to 79 lectures now translated into English as the birth of biopolitics. Foucault writes that the theory of human capital, a breakdown of labor into capital and income that builds on the Marxian conception of labor power is one of capital ability, where the worker himself appears as a sort of enterprise for himself. This formulation of human capital, Foucault calls an abilities machine. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, that's a step further than I meant to go, actually. I'm going to go back a step because that is not what I wanted to start with. Um, where is this quote? Sorry, one second. Um, I can't find the quote. But the basic basically uh we are we are seen as property of the state, and as property of the state, um capitalism and the state has a right to our bodies as labor. Um, to be destroyed in mind as our main function in society. Uh, and so therefore, um, if you're being debilitated in a way that is uh, functional for the state or capitalism, then it doesn't count as disability, right? And it's been a whole whole fight to get sort of these sort of workers' protections um, and, and or anything to see that our bodies are, our, we actually are, have, have, our bodies are our own and not the state's um, and that it's not the state. The state doesn't have an entitlement to kill or maim us as it pleases. Um, and we're going to bring in the feminism here. So entitlement to someone's body for their own use. Yeah, yeah, that feels like uh, content warning, sexual assault. Uh, yes, it does. So we're going to take that back again to our original definition of colonialism. Um, this is from this journal which i really really like and people should get it's called lies this is the second one in the journal i keep holding it up and it doesn't work uh, a journal of materialist feminism so um so the 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 conception of state or capitalism as having a right to people's bodies who are already seen as disposable either to uh have violence against them to show state power or to um, control their those bodies in some way or to, um, to just take for their own use as needed. And this is this is rooted in uh, chattel slavery and this is rooted in colonial violence against um, native populations and native women. So lies look. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about a specific incident that is an important one. And uh, again, with all of the content warnings, 
On the afternoon of December 17th, 2012, just six days after the beginning of Chief Spence's hunger strike, a 36-year-old First Nations woman was walking to the store in the Ontario city of Thunder Bay when two men pulled her over, when two men pulled over, forced her into their truck, beat her, strangled her, and raped her while explicitly telling her Indians didn't deserve treaty rights. So this was in the middle of obviously fighting for certain treaty rights. So it is specifically by attacking, raping, and killing Indigenous women that settler societies and governments attempt to gain control of Indigenous lands. In order to combat colonial intrusions into our territories, one of the purported missions, um, we need to defend the Native bodies that are all too often desecrated when settlers come to extract resources from Indigenous lands. So um, people don't really, there's a lot of talk. I think Americans especially or USians are just due to our media and due to our the way our society is structured a lot more comfortable talking about um, physical violence than we are talking about sexual violence and uh it just those things are both related to taking control of the body and um in a controlling society um rape is a really important tool of oppression and that needs to be centered in a lot and it's not we don't like talking about it um because it's horrible but also like we can talk it, it just seems it's it's not right and weird to me that we can talk about buildings being blown up and hospitals being blown up easier than we can talk about um sexual violence and how it is also a really important tool of uh state power and settler power and um so uh, I'm talking about it uh, and I'm obviously a little bit of a wreck because I'm talking about it as myself, as a, a survivor of sexual violence, it's important to me and it's hard to talk about. So uh, yes, moving right along. So this, this dynamic um, rooted in colonial violence um, is, is also true of other populations that are seen as needing to be under control or need, or as expendable. So I'm going to read this quote. Violence is what makes the category of gender relevant to, um, oh wait, it seems like a sleight of hand to allege that violence is what would eject Black women from the category of women when violence is what makes the categories of gender relevant to begin with. Black women are targets for specific kinds of violence. They are inherently rapeable or unrapeable insofar as rape of Black women is never considered rape. Their bodies are scandalous or monstrous, an obsession which has famously included the monstrous body of the uh, hot and taut Venus. I don't know what they're talking about here. Okay, their labor should not be remunerated because it is not categorized as labor at all. Their reproduction is subject to another's whims. Their bodies can be violated as long as whoever does it owns them. Their problems are always personal, never political. Yeah. So again, with the concept of uh, our as people's bodies, especially Black women, Indigenous women, bodies being seen as property, like slavery was not that long ago. You know, it really wasn't. And also women being property as being owned by their husbands is very recent. Um, and uh, those dynamics are still very much at play whenever we're talking about bodily autonomy. The fact that um, certain bodies are seen as property and certain bodies are seen as higher value or lower value. And uh, if you are in one of those groupings of people that are supposedly lower value property, then your usefulness to the state or to the capitalism or to the settlers, to settlers colonialism is not necessarily in the labor that you do, uh, but in which is in your entire, which the state is entitled to, but also to uh, your body as a source of resource extraction. Um, so this is also true for individuals with disabilities, uh, seen as like low value as far as a property. If, if a disabled person was property, they'd be a low value property under this like framework of um, people as property. Individuals with property with disabilities are at a significantly higher risk of sexual victimization than people without disabilities. The risk of sexual victimization among dis individuals with, dis with a disability was significantly higher in adult participants compared with risk in minor participants. But I would, there's data is a thing. 
but uh, sensory impairment was a type of disability associated with the highest risk of sexual victimization. So um, I didn't know personally, me and all my disabled friends have all been sexually assaulted. That's just like extraordinarily common, especially when you start talking about intersectional identities, people who have more than one thing going on. So um, if you are disabled and queer, if you're disabled and a person of color, if you're disabled and trans, et cetera, like the disability acts as like an uh, um, magnifier of existing inequality issues. Um, and that definitely translates over into um, sexual violence. Yeah, and trans women as well, and gender gender queer people, trans women specifically too. Uh, let me read this. This was from queer ultra violence. Queer ultra violence. As trans people, we feel corporeality forcibly pushed onto us in an attempt to render us intelligible to use the state of our bodies to comprehend our gender and sell us more natural looking bodies. We feel our bodies outweigh our chosen identities when we interact with others and do not pass. As trans women, as we experience the legacy of trans subjectivity within capitalism, we also feel the weight of its corpore corporeality of women in capitalism crush our existences. We experience the implicit violence and gender division of labor every time we are raped and beaten and con condescended to and treated as a hot female sex toy. It is in this experience that we might see the possibilities of human strike for the trans woman. Trans women experience corp corporeality in a unique way. While capital hopes to continue to use the female body as a proletarian machine to reproduce labor power, trans women's bodies cannot produce more workers and are constantly already viewed as denaturalized. Perhaps in valorizing this inoperability in reproduction and willfully extending it to all forms of reproductive later, we see the pot potentiality of the human strike. So um, again, talking about how certain bodies are then seen as not useful to the state and therefore useful only in the way that they can be extracted for sexual pleasure or power or control. So <laughs> I think we get it. Uh, the state and capitals and colonialism and racism, patriarchy, ableism, transphobia, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera, leads our bodies to being sites of violence, abuse, maiming, and death as an entitlement of the ownership class. Yay. Okay. Um, reading. Abuse as a form of oppression. This is from Why Does He Do That? Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men by Lindy Badcroft. Ah. A home where a woman is abused is a small scale model of much larger oppressive systems that work in remarkably similar ways. Many of the excuses an abusive man uses for verbally tearing his partner to shreds are the same ones that a power mad boss uses for humiliating, humiliating his or her employees. The abusive man's ability to convince himself that his domination of you is for your own good is paralleled by the dictator who says people in this country are too primitive for democracy. If you look at any oppressive organization or system from a racist country club up to a military government, you will find most of the same behaviors and justifications by the powerful that I've described in this book. The tactics of control, the intimidation of victims who try to protest, the undermining of efforts at independence, the negative distortions about the victims in order to cast blame upon them, the careful cultivation of the public image of the oppressors are all, all are present along with many other parallels. The abusive mentality is the mentality of oppression. So um, I see a lot of kind of theory uh, that isn't incorporating sort of the feminist and um, understanding of the patriarchy as to how these abusive systems and these abusive governments are functioning. And I think it's a very, very important missing piece alongside that of uh, disability and dis disablement analysis, because uh, if you don't kind of understand abuse on an interpersonal level, I think you're going to have a lot harder of a time understanding abuse on a systemic level, uh, because it does use oh, so many of the same um, tactics, right? So, um, I have so much more to say on that but what time is it? Yeah, I'm just burning through. We have, I have, I have so much more to say on that. Um, 
for instance, uh, I'm going to read some more from the Lundcraft book. Abuse grows from attitudes and values, not feelings. The roots are ownership. The trunk is entitlement and the branches are control. Yeah, I'm going to read. Abuse grows from attitudes and values, not feelings. The roots are ownership. So when the state is saying that it owns your body and can do whatever it wants with it, when the, when the interpersonal, when the, when the state gives the okay to um, non-state actors, AKA uh, little fascist vigilantes and or just pieces of shit generally, um, gives the AOK -okay for ownership class folks to perform violence on behalf of the state to make sure that um, certain populations are kept under control, right? So the trunk is entitlement, entitlement to our bodies, entitlement to our labor, entitlement to um, uh, entitlement to our land and our space and everything, basically. Um, and then the branches are control. So that using those entitlements in order to have control techniques that include maiming, include killing, include disablement, include um, include sexual violence, include all of these, include, so the control is, the types of control that happen are rooted in those value systems, right? Um, so, okay, so we are allowed to have boundaries, right? So if, if the state and its actors uh, state actors and non-state actors of state violence um, have that entitlement, then we are not allowed to have boundaries against that, right? And uh, anybody who's experienced setting up a putting up a boundary, even a gentle one, and being met with violence in response, kind of understands that dynamic. Um, so if the powerful are entitled to our bodies, then it is an affront to the structures that create that power to say, actually, no, you don't, right? Um, so that's been a fight kind of on multiple fronts and there is the reformist inside the system fight. And then there is the non-reformist outside the system fight. Um, and some issues with the reformist inside the system fight. I'm going to go back to right to maim. Which I, I started talking about it. Then I realized I was on the wrong quote. <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, Yeah. The work machine and the war machine both need bodies that are preordained for injury and maiming, often targeted maiming. Capitalism, war, forced migration, settler, colonial occupation, and in the case of this chapter, U.S. capitalist imperialism are the generators of much of the world's disability, yet contribute unruly source materials for rights discourses that propagate visibility, empowerment, identification, and pride. Much of this debilitation is caused by the exploitive capital, capital by the exploitative capital and imperial structures of the global north, claiming an empowered disability identity as a site of creative embodiment and resistance. What David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder call peripheral embodiment is perhaps more tenable when disability is perceived or felt as the result of an unfortunate accident or a misfortune as an exceptional circumstance for which the body impacted is in no way to blame. Far from suggesting that there is by any means a fortunate accident, I am gesturing to bodily experiences that can be capacitated through a reorganization of resources of white privilege and class and economic mobility. For others, disability is a product, not a byproduct, but a deliberate product of exploitative labor conditions, racist incarceration and policing practices, militarization, and other modes of community disenfranchisement. Livid Lived as the ongoing marking of an already defective body, this body, Alison Kafer writes, is one whose disablement is a foregone conclusion. Disability in these cases does not present any possibility of the reorganization of privilege. Rather, it reinforces the stigma of lack of privilege. Often perceived as the result of aberrant or destructive individual lifestyle choices, the inevitability of disability should be more accurately be comprehended as wedded to biopolitical population metrics. Okay. <sighs> right. So um, the problem with disability rights discourse and sort of the rights discourse in general inside the system is it's trying to carve out more space for certain amounts of people, right? For certain people, it'll carve out space. But as long as the state um, entitlement and capitalist entitlement to... Uh, uh, labor and their right to maim and disable and kill uh, exists, 
Like you're just trying to make space for a few more people to not be part of the debilitated class, but the debilitated class is an inherent part of this current structure. So like all you're saying is that some people will be able to kind of like get out, but other you're leaving everybody else behind. Um, so this is one of the reasons that disability is so white uh, because the entire framework of disability as a liberal identity is rooted in um, trying to become part of the system and part of the protected class of that system, um, which for some folks will never be allowed, right? Specifically for, uh, for black and brown, indigenous, gender queer, like really gender queer people who are not like there's not there's there's cert, there will always be people who will never be allowed into the rights discourse and I so that's just something to consider um when we're talking about like expansion of disability rights and disability pride it's sort of like similar you can see what happened in um the LGBTQ rights movement where um the this thing called homo nationalism started happening where it's like the most patriotic like white heteronormative gay couples who like wanted to get married and have have uh and that's all you know that's all fine and good except for the fact that by doing so you know want to be in the military like letting letting gay people be in the military so it's like well you're there will always be a section of queers who will never be in that place to be sort of rehabilitated by the system and will be left to die uh and the same thing is happening right now also within the trans movement where certain usually white passing uh trans identities are being sort of rehabilitated into the system and into the rights discourse um which necessitates leaving behind because this rights discourse is all about these creating little bubbles creating these little boundaries around who gets to have rights and who doesn't um there's a whole chapter in the right to maim that i don't have time to get into all about the ADA and uh, how transness and queerness and um, the the ADA is so fascinating because um, being gay used to be seen as a disability, basically, because gay used to be seen as a mental illness and the way that that got rehabilitated, but then cut out, made, made sure that uh, trans people and other sort of sexual deviants quote unquote sexual deviance was was uh not allowed to be in that category and therefore not protected by ADA protections. Um doo -doo -doo, it was really cool. A very fascinating chapter. I don't find it. But anyway, that gets it gets it gets really into law and I don't have enough time to like get into that. Um but if it's something you're interested in, definitely look that up. <laughs> So you can sort of see the fight is on all sides, those dynamics when it comes to bodily autonomy. Um, again, because it's all rooted in the state's right to your body, capitalism's right to your body, the ownership class having an entitlement to your body and however it functions in a way that is good for them, right? Um, so abortion and medical care, uh, again, this is a fight on um, women's bodily autonomy and uh, uterus having people's bodily autonomy um, um, because the state wants our bodies for one thing and uh, maybe we don't want our body for that. Um, borders, basically just kind of like the ownership class seeing us as just little uh, production sheep to move around how they need, how they need to. Um, and how does this tie into our current situation with COVID? So, um, I just recycled this slide and added this at the end to kind of put it back in place. Like the state's right to debilitation of owned classes. Right, the state has has a right to debilitate owned classes. And that's its well, that it believes uh, entitlement there of ownership class. Right, so like in the state's view and in the ownership class's view, um, 
uh, people being continually debilitated and disabled and killed um, by being forced to work under circumstances where there's a deadly virus. Um, uh, that's, they are disposed, they're, we're disposable in that way. Like that is our job, right? If we're, especially if you're already part of the debilitated class, that is our job is to um, give up our bodies uh, and our autonomy in that way in order to um, service the ownership class and the state and their needs, right? Um, we're smack in the middle of this pandemic still, and you would not know it by looking at the regular media, by looking at the government statements, by looking at any of that. We just had in January and still happening right now, at the end of February, we're on or going down a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, we're right in the middle of this COVID pandemic, and uh, it's worse really than it was a couple of years ago because at this point, only 20% of the population is vaccinated with the booster that came out in last fall. So, like, this virus is a nightmare and it keeps mutating, it keeps changing. And if you don't have an updated booster, like, you're basically not vaccinated. The vaccines are great at keeping you from dying. But uh, they are not the kind of vaccine that we have for like smallpox or like measles that um, the vaccine is so good that it will stop. Um, it will stop you from getting it. It'll stop you from getting really sick. Um, basically, it'll stop you from dying and it'll kind of like lessen the effects, which is super important for such a dangerous virus. Right. Anything you can do to kind of like lessen the effects of it is very good. But right now, only 20 percent of the population, if that, are up to date on their vaccines. And um, it's it's uh, it's a different class than it was a couple of years ago. And it's everywhere. Literally, we had that Omicron surge. We still had testing available during that. We still had all sorts of like government help. But that all got ended at the end of the pandemic response in the spring of last year. So right now there's no support. There's like no testing. People don't even know it's around. Um, it's airborne, it's spreading everywhere. People are getting extremely sick and having no idea why. Um, there's all of this stuff going on around like social media that's like, what is this weird new virus? Why am I sick all the time? What is happening? It's like, it's COVID everyone. It's just still COVID because that didn't go away. And um, it's kind of, moved more into the gut than in the lungs uh not necessarily but man it's a nightmare so um why would the state let this happen right like a lot of people who still trust the government which i'm not sure why they're doing that but uh i think because it's scarier for some folks to to not <laughs> to sort of realize where we're at um oh one other horrible thing i want to say about covid is it's also uh now it always, it probably always has been or has been for a long time, but now we've got like real steady, strong studies that it um, messes with your immune system, right? So we basically got airborne HIV running around. It messes up your immune system. It attacks your different organs. It can give you dementia. It can give you, it's just really nasty. And why would the government then just like pretend it's not happening? Um, because according to the ownership cl class and the capitals class, um, it's not because they have air filtration. They have pe they still have access to high quality testing. Um, they still they live in larger open spaces. You know, they have uh, better health care. They have all of these things. And I just remember um, tuberculosis was everywhere. And but mostly only poor people died from it. Right mostly only poor people used to die from tuber tuber tuberculosis just because if you have a higher quality of life already and you have access to good food and access to um, good medicine and less stress overall like all of these things will make healthcare needs lessen right so the the ownership class doesn't care if the lower class dies because or gets more disabled because that's just a show of force of what state power is right us getting more disabled having disability on our bodies um be, if you're part if you're especially if you're already part of what's considered the debilitated class that's your job is to just become a resource for the state to use up right um so 
Uh, my point is, wearing a mask is resistance to state violence. Also, some people literally can't wear masks for various reasons, which makes it so much more important for community care so that the people who can't wear masks or can't get vaccinated um, are still protected by community care, um, by everyone else who can wear a mask and can vaccinate by people. Um, now you cannot, clean air is a thing you have to pay for. So updated filtration, updated filtration systems, um, being aware of all this stuff, being COVID conscious is a way to resist state violence. And it's also why when you wear a mask, you feel like you're in danger because it is a boundary. A mask is a boundary that you're putting up against the state's right to kill and maim you. And uh, people who are pro-state violence, um, people even just, like liberals who um, want to believe in the state, and if they believe in the state, then somewhere in there they believe that the, they are not part of the debilitated class, and uh, they don't want to be associated with the debilitated class. And uh, so people have very strong reactions to masks. Uh, because it is resistance to state violence. And we all know how that goes. If you resist state violence, I think uh, a lot of us are well aware that resisting state violence results in um, huge abusive reactions against setting a boundary. Uh, so I'm still leaving this up for five more seconds for people to look at. Wearing a mask is resistance to state violence. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Where are we at time-wise? Oh yeah, right on time. Oh yeah, stuff about community if we have time, uh, boundaries, cults, et cetera. Um, maybe I'll just open up to questions now though. Cause that was kind of like the big like, da -da, like end of the presentation um, thing. Because I, I also, I got a message from the last one. Someone was upset about how I talked about community and I'm happy to go into that. Cause I think that's also a really important topic. Um, and or we can also talk about how to set how to how to more safely set a boundary that's something i teach folks um or we can talk about like culty fashy dynamics i don't know whatever people are interested in oh oh yeah i forgot i had this slide too this is this is also this is also re, re, um <laughs> this was from the last uh episode or presentation so same thing so by underclass also means uh debilitated class, not the owning class, right? Okay. Uh, is that it? That's it. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Moss. That was really provocative. I think there's a lot of interesting things to reflect on there. And we we did get a couple questions in the Q&A, just poking at this distinction between disability um, uh, or uh, disablement and debilitation. Um, and I'm going to, if, if it's okay with you, I'm going to try and say back to you what I think you were telling us, and you can you can correct me if I've got it wrong. Um, my understanding was that uh, the idea is that um, debilitation, um, unlike um, disablement, is something that is assumed to be normative and occurring um, uh, on the bodies of individuals whom the state and the owning class view as fundamentally disposable. And so there's this sort of struggle to get things recognized as disability, but inevitably, like no matter how many experiences we pull over into the disability class, there's still populations that are excluded from that kind of like political identity and are still treated as sort of normatively like used up. Is that is that kind of a, am I getting that? Yeah, that was brilliant that how you said it. That's exactly right. And again, um, I'm not, I, this is a theory that is new to me. So I'm doing my best to kind of sp spread it around. But if you want to read more, very in depth, uh, The Right to Name, this book right here is um, the way to go. It was kind of expensive. It was like 30 something dollars. But if this is, it's 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 very rich and very in depth. And um, uh let me um yeah, I see it's, yeah, it's can, from I Duke University Press are the best. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh Jasper K. Puar, Debility Capacity, Disability. And here's another, here's another little quote. Um, what is a non-disabled body and as it 
and is it the same as an able body? Layers of precarity and vulnerability to police brutality, reckless maiming and killing, deprivation and destruction of resources that are daily features of living for some populations must not be smoothed over by hailing these bodies as able-bodied if they do not have or claim to be a person with disability. In the words of disability studies scholar and prison abolitionist Liet Ben Mosh, uh, it does not matter if people identify as disabled or not. Hands up, don't shoot is not a catchy slogan that emerges from or announces able-bodied populations. Rather, this common Black Lives Matter chant is a revolutionary call for redressing the debilitating logics of racial capitalism. Yeah, did that help at all? Yeah, that's a great quote. Um, and I maybe if it's okay with you, I'll I'll kind of dip into another question submitted in the Q and A. And folks, please, um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so. Yeah, we've got an anonymous attendee um, who writes, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the debilitation of our bodies via COVID, creating long-term illnesses for many, and how this has uh, um, impacted, oh, wait, also, oh, and how it also has impacts as it generates increased needs and for capitalist profits in the marketing of pharmaceutical and medical industrial complexes. I know it's a huge topic, but if you have any reflections around what this means slash how it feels in terms of imperialist futures, no wrong answers, just big things I'm feeling through uh, uh, feeling through that uh, feels meaningful to share in this conversation. Yeah, one way I'm seeing this happen very directly is the state's response heavily um, being reliant on vaccination as the way to stop COVID. Um, and vaccination, I'm pro-vaccination. I'm Vaccination is a very, very important tool. However, um, it is more expensive. It's harder to um, access oftentimes. It is, um, especially now that the government has pulled funding, right? There's still the bridge access program until the end of this year, but um, vaccination can be very expensive. It's also, it's more invasive. Whenever there's some, a way that you can do, have a preventative measure that's less invasive is preferable, right? So, um, like, vaccination as the, as the solution, why, why, when we have, when we know that masks are cheaper, uh, more accessible, more functional, in a lot of ways, like we want to do a layered approach, right? But the fact that the state is deciding, like, we're going to concentrate only on vaccination, vaccine relax as our main, when we know that the vaccination for COVID doesn't stop you from getting COVID, it doesn't stop you from spreading COVID, it doesn't stop you from getting long COVID. Like we don't have, COVID is a really difficult disease and the technology is just not there yet. It's why you still have to get yearly flu shots too. There's just certain diseases. There's some that are easily preventable by vaccination, right? Like chicken pox is preventable by vaccination. Measles is preventable by vaccination. Smallpox is pre totally preventable. These things, are, those are, you get the shot, you're good to go. It's a very effective, the COVID vaccination, it's just a really difficult virus. So like we should be having a layered approach. So the fact that the state is choosing to focus solely on a more expensive, harder to access, more invasive um, uh, approach to stopping this less effective approach to stopping instead of going for these like layered um, education, masking, um, air filtration upgrades, because those things are more, those things are going to be more expensive and uh, more boundary, right? Like the buildings, people don't want to pay for the, getting HVAC updated. Like people, like the ownership class doesn't want to pay for that, right? Like um, even though we know that, so that's kind of, that's, I, I, I know that's not the only thing you said, but I've kind of forgot I've gone on a rant. But um, yeah, that's that's one example I can see of like how it's very clearly um, not the, the 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 logics of the response are not based in science or on based on what's best for these communities. It's based on what's best for the ownership class um, in a very short sighted way, right? Because like, you, but yeah, is there. Yeah. Was that help? Was that good? <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I, I love that you uh, use the phrase vaccine and relax because we actually had someone um, submit uh, a comment in the Q&A. Um, and just before you even use the term, uh, they said uh. vaccine relax is definitely a lie. 
I was infected yeah. with COVID at my food service job after four doses of vaccine. So exactly yep, I, a, a uh, great illustration of what you were talking about. Yep. I have long COVID after after being fully vaccinated, and that's very common. Um, it's also, you have to understand too, it's common because people who aren't vaccinated a lot of times just die. So they don't get long COVID because they died, right? So like, it's not like the vaccine's not doing anything, but the idea of vax and relax, that vaccines are enough for this particular situation that we're in, is just not true. It's just not true, but it's it's less expensive for the government. Well, and it's incredibly profitable for big pharma. So yeah, um, to take that approach. So uh, we, we've got a, another question here, which I think is a great one. Um, this individual asks if you have any recommendations for books, essays, or videos, et cetera, that deal with these topics, but in simple language, um, uh, maybe something uh, kind of accessible. Um, and noted, I'm dyslexic, so a lot of socio-political writing can be tricky for me, but I really need yeah. slash want to understand. Thanks so much for the workshop. And thanks yeah, for that I definitely. Question. I think I think that popular education is super important and um, and uh, over sometimes neglected these days, honestly, in uh, radical and anarchist spaces. Um, but if you go back to like old school anarchist praxis, like the popular education and making sure things were in easy, accessible language was a really was really important. And so I, I am trying to do that. Um, a lot of it is so dense. And mm. um, this is sort of a call for other other anarchist uh, teachers to sort of do that translation work. One of my the, the book that got me into anarchism was What is Anarchism by um, um, Alexander Berkman. And because he he intentionally wrote with um, uh, uh, working class uh, lab, um, folks in mind, he intentionally wrote in simple language. And that's also uh, that's another way that um, disability justice is good for everybody, because if things are written in plain speak in plain language and simple language, it makes it more accessible for everybody. Um, and that's something I'm working on this. I, this is like, a, I would love to write this up in a way that is just like a pamphlet. I, cause I haven't seen anything like this really. I haven't seen these concepts put in a simple way. So, you know, that's maybe on my plate, although I'm also just trying to survive as a disabled person right now. Well, maybe so we can also take... crowdsource that a little and I'll say, <laughs> yeah, if, if there's awesome. anybody currently on this, uh, call who has recommendations for media, whether that's podcasts or videos or or books, um, maybe drop them in the Q&A. And I think we would all love to, to hear what you think. Oh yeah, A Death Panel is a good podcast. Um, they're a little bit on the communist end for me. <laughs> but they do a great they do a great job um on just on talking about if you're interested in sort of the policy and the the how the governmental policy has completely bungled the pandemic response there can really you say great... the name of the podcast one more time death panel okay yeah um well, i'll drop a link um in the chat there for folks i'm trying to think um Anything by uh, Leah Lakshmi, Piesna, Summer Sinna. Um, they're an amazing writer and um, they do a great job. I haven't, I haven't, I'm sure they have more essays. I would check, I would check with anybody who's uh, related, who works with the Disability Visibility Project. Alice Wong mm -hmm. is also an ex extremely good essay writer. Um, and um, I'm like looking at my bookshelf, <laughs> see like what else <laughs> I can recommend um yeah well, there's let's, let's, not enough not enough let's put a pin in that and maybe we'll we'll get a couple more um uh suggestions i uh, i see we've got one or two more q a questions coming in but i, I want to circle back to the community question um and i, I think that this question uh, originates with a comment you made um back in september where you described community as neutral um right and uh the the commenter was i guess concerned that that might <laughs> minimize the value in the struggle to build communities of resistance um and support i, I, I laugh i laughed because you are so nice about it concerned they called me disgusting they said that my view was disgusting um and I, I I love that I'm talking about boundaries right now because they felt the need to 
I didn't put my, I don't have my like email or anything accessible here because I don't have the capacity um, to manage that kind of stuff. But they reached out to Firestorm to make sure that I got the message that they thought my comments on on community were disgusting. Uh, um, so I, I'm I am I do want to talk about that. <laughs> um, it kind of derailed me a little bit when I got that message. So I don't know if that was their point, but let me let me clarify what I meant. So I was saying I I compared community to violence in that it's a semantic discussion a lot of the time that the word community means so many different things to so many different people. It has very expansive definitions. It has very defined definitions. The same with the word violence. It has very expansive definitions. It has a very specific definitions. People, um, depending on the context, it has different meanings. Like English is not great at these concepts in general. Like violence is just, it's hard to define as a concept. So when one person is talking, you can get into semantic, you can get into arguments about these concepts that are simply stuck into the semantic stage. You're not even talking about anything actual actionable, right? So like, that's what I mean when I say community and violence are similar in that way um and so like the 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 term itself is neutral because a, a community can be something very negative i study fascism right like fascism is super communal like very community oriented folks in the kkk right um and also like violence is again it's like one of those things it's like how are you defining violence are you talking about poverty are you talking about um are you talking about intimidation are you talking about actual being beaten or killed you know i had i saw one i saw one um action this was like back in like 2016 or something where a whole lot of people gathered around somebody's house and just stood there silently and there was no like physical attacks there was nothing like that but the person whose house it was described it as incredibly violent like they so like to them the sort of just threat of violence counts as violence and so when i talk about community i'm going to move back over to community um when i talk about community being neutral i mean that who are what is the context who are you talking about it can be extremely negative especially as an as uh as um an uh autistic person um we tend to be very prone to getting in very dangerous situations on uh, due to the idea of community or needing community um cults mlms uh all sorts of like uh, abusive situations where the promise of community or connection can lead you to very bad dark places where you're being taken advantage of and so like i'm very and I, i've ended up in those situations pre previously right when someone and this happens on the left this happens on the left all the time right because there's a lot of people who are vulnerable in lots of different ways um who are looking for community who are desperate for social connection and someone promises them a pre-made community join our community that can have all that's can be very negative that can be very bad <laughs> right um so that, and I personally feel also sort of as a black on black anarchist too, that the focus on these community gatherings, I've just, I, this like needing to build this sort of beloved community. It's a very sort of Christian ideal um, of, uh, is, uh, is, is not real for a lot of people. There's folks who can easily plug in and find a lot of friends and groups, but also tons of energy is wasted, in my personal opinion, on trying to make giant group dynamics function. Like if you've got groups of like hundreds of people, um, you know, that's like more of a socialist take on things. Um, I'm more into like groups of four or five, you know, somewhere between ideally three to eight people as uh, is, is your group size. Um, you can get so much done. You can create so much change with just a very small group of friends. Um, and so I try, instead of talking about community, which is very bulbous, um, I talk about friends. Like you just need to make some friends. In a group of 100 people, I'll maybe get along with and really like and really make friends with maybe one person. And if that's your bar, instead of being like, I'm going to jump into this community and have all the social that I need, have all of the support that I need. Yay, I found this like community based on this identity or this like, or this like um, uh, goal, you know, like then it, um, and you're expecting to just be able to walk into a pre-made community and have all of those needs met that can lead to so much heartbreak and so much um 
terribleness. So I, instead, you just need to build your own network, right? You, you, there are networks that exist, right? But you're not ever going to know everyone in there. You're not going to like everybody in there. If every group of 100 people, maybe pick one or two people that you really want to put your energy into, right? And then over time, you can build a network of friends and connections, right? And I think that's a, I think that's a healthier way to talk about it than talking about kind of community because um, I've way too often heard how how this how this multi level marketing campaign saved my life. I, you know, it. <laughs> I, so that's what I meant. And uh, um, I think especially for neurodivergent people, um, it can be a real trap. And there are a lot of people who are abusive in leftist spaces um, because there are so many people there who are so desperate for connection and love. And um, so just my, my, my neurodivergent friends, my vulnerable friends, just be aware of that, please. And just put the bar at having a couple friends instead of um, having a full supportive community because for most people that doesn't really exist unless you put a lot of time and effort into building it so that's what i meant appreciate the clarification some some heavy stuff um so uh we did have somebody weigh in here to share um a social media account that they think is a great resource which i'm not familiar with um but maybe you are it's um imani barbaran oh hell yeah um, yeah, I talk, I talked oh. about her a lot. Critches and Spice in the last episode. I have a huge crush on her. But yeah, she is amazing. Definitely. Thank you for mentioning for, thank you for mentioning her. She's probably one of our best um messengers. Awesome. Um, and I'll see if I can find or if anybody else is able to find an actual URL there. We can drop that in the chat. Um then also uh someone chimed in to share some information. I think there was a quote you were reading. Um uh, let's see, regarding the so-called hot and tot Venus mentioned earlier, um, oh, yeah. Sarah Bartman was an indigenous South African who was exhibited in the 19th century as a hypersexualized sideshow attraction while alive and after death in Europe by Europeans. Oh, it's not an anarchist foolish. analysis, but there's foolish. yeah um, a decent radio documentary with transcript here. Um, and there's a CBC, uh, link which i'll share again i i'm just sharing this from somebody in the chat i have not listened to it i cannot recommend it but um but it is coming by way of another participant um uh in case the podcast is not viewable in the u.s uh look for the podcast stuff the british stole season two oh, yes called not your venus so yes folks can check i have that heard out. that it was really good thank you for that yeah, and it, I um, I was just was in the middle of a paragraph, and it was kind of taken out of context, so I sort of skipped over it. But, um, yeah, very important. Thank you. Um, and the same helpful uh, participant also uh, shared um, another uh, a resource for folks um, who said, uh, "I have difficulty with reading, and just started reading Body Horror, Capitalism, Fear, Misogyny, Jokes uh, by Anne Elizabeth Moore." It's written as a personal slash political essay, so I'm finding it very accessible. There's a COVID updated version published 2023, but it was originally from 2020, uh, excuse me, 2017. That's a nice. great suggestion. Yeah, good title. Yeah, hopefully all these will got all sent out in an email. Yeah, we'll make sure that the the full book list uh, gets gets sent out. Um. All right. Let's see. Just scanning over questions here um so we've got uh someone who writes um as the vaccine is non-sterilizing i.e protective but it doesn't prevent the illness there you go. um and as uh we know multiple reinfections increase not only the damage but the odds of long covid each time many of us are deeply invested in that multi-layered approach um, referencing back to the more than vaccines. Um, lots of what we learned from AIDS was that as we are disposable as a class, it comes down to us to take care of us um, and that we're uh, pre-written off. By definition, no one has, uh, no one was ever coming to step in and save us. Yet even in our own spaces, I see abandonment, even in spaces that should know better, uh, that should recognize multi-layered protections as necessity. 
which is why it's so meaningful to have conversations like this safely online. Can you speak to that isolation uh, protection balance? Oh, yeah, it's so hard. It's so much more heartbreaking when people who are supposed to be on your side act like that. It's so hard. Um, you said it so well. I mean, that they just said it so beautifully. <laughs> Let me read it again. Yeah, and I'll say I I um was oh, here we go. Okay. here at the bookstore today. And I think we had three different people come in today and tell us how much we they appreciated that we still require masks and how uncommon it is for them to find spaces like that. I mean how isolating it is. Um yeah, so it's it is so hard. Yeah. It's, and I get sick of screens and with long COVID too, I can't even look at a screen that long. Like a lot of the like online online accessible things like i really do need in-person stuff sometimes just for my own yep. but it has to be covid safe and we can do it i saw a really funny tweet that was like to like being increasingly like disabled and killed by this virus that can be uh defeated by a fan in a cardboard box is a choice <laughs> right like literally we have the tools we, we have the tools this isn't even a situation where like nobody knows what's going on like the plague you know nobody had we didn't have germ theory people were just like dying everyone's like is it the wrath of god i don't know what's happening like we know what's happening when we have the tools and we're not using them and that's part of fascism honestly it is part of the fascist creep is the normalization of mass death is the wanting to separate yourself as much as you can from the debilitated classes um to you know as much as you can say like oh yeah it's so sad it's so hard it's just still being like um really but really wanting to be separate still from that and um for some folks with an inter intersectional identity um if your community has taken the stance that um current be, be, becoming part of the class with rights is more important in the long term than current safety right because wearing like i said the, the the framework of like if you understand that wearing and people don't necessarily understand this on like a conscious level but like wearing a mask says that you stand against the state right now right it's a so people who say they stand against the state and then don't wear a mask they just need need a better theory, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it's sort of sort of why people smoke cigarettes too. We're like, oh, I don't care if I die. Like I'm, I I flirt with death as part of being punk rock or something. Um, but um, you know, but then if there's if there's if they're smoking in the around little kids and stuff, like there's you're still kind of an asshole. Like <laughs> I don't know. Like it's just sort of. But then you know that gets into class politics. It's very complicated, and I should probably. I forget that I'm being, it should, it's, it's very complicated. Oh God. Um, so I, I don't know. I just know that the, the normalization of uh, mass death sucks and is part of a fascist slide. Um, and then you can find weird little, and with, I like looking at the AIDS history. I was hoping to go way more into the into history of AIDS because uh, the way that the queer community uh, functioned during the AIDS crisis, especially like the black queer community and the black community and, um, uh, going back to the book that I talked about a lot last time, um, The Viral Underclass by Stephen Thrasher uh, talks a lot about this. Um, I found this little thing. Let's see if I can get it. In the... ooh, ooh, there we go. Oh, we had it for a second. 50, 50, 50 things you can do about AIDS. Anyway, it's this little tiny hmm. book that was published in like 1992 that lists just like things you can do about AIDS and um, uh, very simple like at the office if someone in your office has AIDS try to avoid wearing a strong perfume or cologne to work many people with AIDS have a heightened sense of smell and vulnerable to science sinus infections uh, in your spare time lend a helping paw often people with AIDS are disabled in some way and are unable to take care of their dogs having a dog is often important for people with AIDS because many of them have a homebound without much companionship and so and it's just like this cute little list, but it didn't come out. This little pamphlet didn't come out until the 90s, right? Like, and AIDS had already been around for 20, 30 years at that point. It wasn't really recognized until 81, but it had been around for a long time. And um, I feel like I wish we could sort of like jumpstart that because like this, we we have the AIDS crisis as a backdrop, as part of our history. And they went through that. So like, why are we going through this again? 
like we're recreating the wheel to try and like get this jump started when like the the blueprint's already there right like our queer ancestors did this already so it's like we should know how to do this kind of community care and we've forgotten that and a lot of having forgotten that is that a lot of those people died is that people a lot and a lot of our queer ancestors died and so we don't have the queer elders in our life to sort of walk us through how to do this again a lot of the queer elders that we do have honestly are kind of in denial about it i think they're just traumatized and they don't want to do the covid thing again the aids thing again but um we have the blueprints we have the tools why people aren't using them i wish i knew i am not socially in that like caught i don't have the skills to understand I'm anti-fascist, right? Like I'm not being pulled in by the fascist wave, so I don't know what that feels like. <laughs> so I don't know why people do it. I don't know. Um, hmm. Man, if somebody else, people who are smarter than smarter than me, can could figure that out, that'd be great. Um, there's there's this thing called uh, like what's it called? Like interviewing, uh, compassionate interviews or something, where like a way to change people's. There's whole studies on like a whole series of on how to change people's minds about stuff, where you like talk to them and like figure out where they're coming up. It all feels very manipulative to me, but maybe that's how it needs to be to get people to like hear what you're saying. Um I don't I don't really know. I think but more and more spaces do exist. There is a push. People do care. It's becoming so obvious that not everybody can and I've also had to go away from quote unquote radical spaces in a lot of places because um there's just people who are more um ready to do community care just because of a cultural background that understands community Moss, we may have lost you. Oh, it's part I of think, a liberal caste. I think you you, you out, the cut out for a minute there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did. Oh. Okay. Well, that anyway, I was trying to rant. <laughs> so that's fine. I think we're at, we're coming up on a good end point. Um. So these yeah. what, whoever's having technical difficulties, whether it's me or you, um. Uh, perhaps we can um, can close it out here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you back to talk again. And um, as before, you've introduced a lot of ideas that are new and exciting for me and I'm sure other folks who joined in tonight. So thank you so much for, for doing that work um, and putting it together for us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, I know it's a little scattered. It's a uh, long COVID brain and trauma brain and I'm thank you for being everyone being patient, understanding with me as I try to get these very complicated ideas across in a way that makes any sense at all. Um, I'm, uh, but yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate you having me here. Absolutely. Um, well, perhaps we'll do it again. And thanks to everybody who came um, and thanks to folks who uh, use that Q and a tool to talk back or um, ask questions uh, really um uh, makes the, the webinar format a little less painful to have you here. So thanks y'all. Hope everybody has a great night and, um, we will see you again soon.